Well, uh, the chair of the Standing Committee on Finance, Yunus Karim, is not only dealing with the PIC. He says that South Africa is still bleeding billions in terms of illicit financial flows. Of course, this committee also uh, in the past looking at state-owned entities uh, involved in dodgy dealings and private companies, the likes of Steinhoff there. We're joined now uh, by the chair, Yunus Karim, from our studio in Parliament. Uh, good evening to you, Mr. Karim. Let Let's start with the PIC. What, what could change and, and what should change about the way the, the Public Investment Corporation invests? Well, we have two bills before Parliament. Good evening to you and the viewers. Uh, before Parliament right now, one is a private member's bill by Mr. David Mania of the DA and the other is a committee bill. There is some overlap between the two bills and some differences. Now, the committee bill is what I'll focus on. And basically, uh, what we're seeking to do is to ensure greater openness and transparency by the PIC. Uh, we want to ensure more effective accountability to Parliament and ourselves having a more effective oversight role. But also, we feel that uh, consideration needs to be given to up to three union representatives uh, being on the PIC board. Now, obviously, the union representatives who are appointed to the board should also meet the criteria of all board members. That is, they have to have the necessary skills in asset management and uh, the other technical skills that are required to ensure that the uh, PIC secures the rate of uh, return on investments that uh, are adequate. Now, we're also arguing, the committee is, it's a committee bill based on various uh, meetings we've had with the PIC over the nine months. In fact, the PIC has been, been before our committee over the last nine months, I think at least six to eight times, more than any other institution uh, that we have oversight responsibilities over. And in the processes, we feel that uh, uh, we should set out more clearly in the bill, in the law, the investment criteria. Yes, to adequate returns, but also at the same time. Given the weight the PIC carries in the economy, managing some two trillion uh, rands of uh, funds, close to two trillion rands, they are vitally important to the country's uh, transformation and developmental goals. They are crucial, for example, to ensuring that the economy is deracialized, that African and black more generally entrepreneurs are given space to enter the economy, but at the same time, obviously, they have to protect workers' interests and ensure that their pensions are secure. The, the Government Employment Pension Fund, the GEPF, is, is already uh, overseeing the, the PIC, or, or we've had them in before, and they explain very rationally how they lay out the, the mandate to the PIC. They tell the PIC on which grounds they are allowed to invest and not allowed to invest. Why is that not working? That's a matter you need to ask the GEPF uh, and indeed also the trade union representatives on the GEPF. They are there anyway. Now, the request to have uh, representation on the board of PIC by union representatives have come from themselves. And I think they are right to ask for this representation. Obviously, today we just had the first tranche of public hearings. There will be further consideration of what uh, stakeholders and civil society have to say. We haven't taken any final decision. It's merely a draft bill. In fact, Parliament rises shortly in the next week to two, and then we will reconvene from the middle of August to, uh, to, to late September for the third quarter. It's in that period from, I think, uh, middle of August to the end of August that will give much, much more concerted attention to all these issues. So we need to engage more with experts and with civil society stakeholders to arrive at some degree of consensus on what it is we do. But certainly, if the GIP was fulfilling its role properly, and if in fact the PIC was investing firmly within the framework of the GEPF, we wouldn't be having some of the controversies we do in the public domain. We should stress, though, that while there is a crucial importance to protect the interests of the pensioners in the public sector who are in the GEPF, uh, at the same time, workers also have to contribute uh, towards the developmental goals of the country. In fact, it is working people 
and the poor and the disadvantaged generally who can benefit enormously from adro adroit and strategic investments by the PIC. Mm -hmm. I should stress too that ultimately what you have here is a defined pension benefit. So it means effectively that if the PIC and the GEP have failed to sustain adequate returns for their members, it will mean the fiscus will have to come to the rescue, the taxpayer effectively. So we as parliament have a vested interest and so indeed does the national treasury to ensure some effective oversight because ultimately, remember it's the fiscus, as I earlier said, that will have to come to the rescue of the GEPF and the PIC mm -hmm. if there are not adequate returns for those government employees. Is, is there not a potential problem here in that the PIC, uh, maybe there have been some concerns, but they've also made some good investments. And, and they're an investment uh, body, we know competing with other investment bodies that have to be very agile, uh, move in and out of investments, trade very quickly. Could we not bog this, uh, the PIC down with too much oversight? Yes, you're quite right. We are acutely aware of that. And so it is that we will give further consideration of how we consider uh, union representation in the PIC. It cannot be at the expense of the agility and the uh, adroit decision making and quick decision making that you speak of. We're aware of that. Uh, we're looking into that. We haven't taken any final decision. But we don't think that inevitably having uh, effective union representation on the board will necessarily undermine those goals. At the very least, it will give union experts or union representatives a better idea of how these decisions are made and why. Now, obviously, in a market economy, you take risks. All asset managers do. You win most times, maybe, but at sometimes you lose. Now, for example, on Steinoff, this matter was raised this morning in the public hearings. The PIC was attacked. But is it fair to attack the PIC for that? Who would have known that Steinoff will collapse the way it did, right? So there are decisions they make in good faith, and then they turn out uh, not to give the returns that are expected. But on the other hand, there are also decisions the PIC might make that they should have anticipated are not in the interests of the members of the GEPF. And those decisions uh, are increasingly being brought into the public domain. May I stress also, it's a lot of smokes and mirrors. The accusations being made that the board is about to suspend the uh, CEO, Mr. Dr. Daniel Machila, from uh, his position for now. I, I think we should wait for the police to complete the investigation. I think we should allow the board to do its job of oversight in respect of this matter, and they must report to the public via parliament. For us, it's not to interfere in the internal operational issues. We don't have the forensic or technical or investigative capacity to tell whether Dr. Machila is in fact doing what he's accused of doing. So we wait on the board to report to us. And in fact, on Tuesday next, some of these issues that are currently in the public domain will in fact be pursued with the board chairperson, the deputy minister of finance, and the CEO and others who will come from the PIC. So our committee has been persistently preoccupied with these issues and will continue to do so in the interest both of the members of the GEPF and the public. Mm. Uh, I think you raise an interesting point about Steinhoff, and I was uh, astounded to see that even the European Central Bank was heavily invested in Steinhoff, so, so nobody knew. Uh, I, I don't have you for, for much longer, Mr. Karim, so uh, a broad question. You, you raised Steinhoff. Uh, you've also been looking at state-owned entities. People are looking at all of this saying at least we're, we're starting to air the dirty laundry, uh, but no major high-profile arrests yet. Uh, the, the players still out and about uh, saying crazy things. Uh, what, what's your overall view of, of the functioning of your committee, of, of how uh, South Africa's finances and, and ethical leadership and all of that is, is stacking up right now? Well, when it comes to state-owned entities, as you know, the Public Enterprises Committee deals with that mainly, right? But insofar as you're asking a general question, I, I think the public has reached the end of its tether, and so have many parliamentarians, about the abuse of public resources, both by the private sector and uh, people within the public sector. And so it is the Public Enterprises Committee carried out this exhaustive inquiry and they're about to report on it, right? Now, we're also acutely aware 
that the public-private sector is also much to blame. For example, uh, if you look at the series uh, litany of uh, uh, corporate failures, KPMG, Steinoff, uh, a whole lot of accusations against others, uh, I, I, I think really that uh, the committee has to play a more active role in ensuring the regulators and the investigative authorities uh, deal with these matters. For example, there are staggering amounts of money, you said in your initial introduction to this uh, interview, that are leaving the country through illicit financial flows. Now, by its very nature, it's hard to give an amount, right? But global financial integrity suggests that between 2002 and 2012, $122 billion left South Africa illegally. We don't know the exact amount, but we do know that we are amongst the 10 worst countries for illicit financial flows. Only a month ago, SARS reported that we are amongst the top five countries for uh, illicit tobacco trade. And we really feel that there should be an interministerial committee coordinated by the Minister of Finance and including possibly the Ministers of Trade and Industry, Police, Intelligence and uh, uh, Justice to work together to oversee a recently formed interagency structure to deal with illicit financial flows. Now here we have it, before Parliament right now, is this bill that deals with a 1% increase in VAT. Now from that, the government hopes to secure 22.9 billion. Now if we reduced this flow of illicit money, that 22.9 billion from VAT would not be necessary. It's estimated, Minister Kodan the other day said in the public domain that state capture alone uh, might have lost us something like 100 billion runs. We have been calling repeatedly for far more effective investigation by the Hawks. For example, 1,700 South Africans are mentioned in the Panama Papers, right? For having money in bank accounts and so on in Panama, which is, as you know, uh, a haven for this sort of uh, illegal money. Now, obviously, of the 1,700, there may be many, many South Africans who have done so legally. There's no problem with that. But there are many others, surely, who haven't done so. You can't tell me or the committee that of the 1,700, there isn't a single person who's transferred money illegally. There's the Paradise Papers and so on. We think the performance of government, its agencies in this regard, are abysmal. And we have in Parliament the three committees, Finance, Trade and Industry and Minerals, who meet twice a year collectively to pursue uh, uh, progress in regard to uh, pinning down people who are responsible for illicit financial flows. And in fact, in our own committee, every quarter, when SARS and National Treasury appears before us, a standing item is progress on illicit financial flows. We are very impressed by the acting commissioner, Mark Kingon's recent uh, appearance before our committee some two weeks ago. We expressed a candor we haven't heard, an openness we haven't heard before. He effectively said to us, to paraphrase him, that they've dropped the ball, as it were, on illicit financial flows and illicit tobacco, and that they're meaning to do much more about this. Now, mining economies are very susceptible to money going out. That's through base erosion and profit shifting. So you have tax avoidance, where people avoid paying the taxes that they do to pay through the interventions of the PWCs of this world, who offer them this technical advice to find a way to wriggle around the law. That's tax, ev tax avoidance, it's legal, but frankly, morally unacceptable. Mm. Then you've got tax evasion, where you deliberately flout the law. To us as members of parliament, what is the big difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance? It boils down to this. Both, both forms are actually just morally wrong. Yeah. We are in a country where we have just raised VAT, where we are desperate for our investment and growth and job creation reasons uh, to, to get more uh, revenue. The tax authority has not performed as well as it should. Now, here it is. You can't blame SARS alone. You need all of these agencies. What we've repeatedly said, Francis, is that we want to see people in jail. That will at least deter others. Far too many people are perpetrating these illicit financial flows and there's nobody going to uh, jail. And that's what we'd like to see. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're pressing our, our fellow committee, as it were, the police committee, to also in its quarterly engagement with the Hawks to secure greater pressure on them to ensure that people end up in jail. That's where they belong.
What uh, they're doing is a crime. And this is private sector crime. They always focus on public sector, that's correct. But invariably, where you have public sector crime, you also have a private sector mm-hmm. hand. So in short, the private sector must focus on itself and government needs to be far more effective, the state as a whole, in ensuring that they pay for their crimes. Mr. Karim, it's encouraging to see outrage uh, from a uh, chair of a parliamentary committee. Thank you for being with us tonight. We have to cut Thank it there uh, because we're going to take you live to President Soro Ramaphosa.